So we are beyond excited to have you in the house, literally in my house. <laughs> literally. Here in the flesh, IRL, in real life. My God. Before we started recording, we were saying, um, we're just talking about the book, which we'll get into more. And But one of the things I was saying, I, I don't know if this is a good jump off or not, but it was kind of on the tip of my tongue. And I said, wait, wait until we start recording to say it. <laughs> so there's a part in the book in the very beginning where you talk about your dad, right? And I thought it was smart. I don't know if smart is the right word, but it felt powerful. And I will say smart, actually. Where a book about love, the very first entryway into a book about love is about death uh, yeah. and about loss. Mm -hmm. And I just, there was something about that that was so powerful to me because it was like, it reminds me of like this archetype of like the life, death, life mother, right? Or this concept of like, you can't have one without the other. You can't have dark without light. You can't have light without dark. So I don't know. I mean, I guess I want to start there. Like, was that something that you just like intuitively knew that you wanted to start it, kind of open it that way? Or did that come later? Boy, it's so interesting even asking that question because I'm trying to reflect like, how did I get there initially? But I was working on a collection of stories, which this kind of rolled into. And part of my idea was to talk about the stages of love. And when you, you know, track the stages of love, they're so optimistic. And I felt like they were missing something. For me, the thing they were missing was that every love begins with endings. Right? E e even, even your first love. I have a, a son who is uh, his first love. Mm -hmm. And it's delightful. But you know what's interesting is he is slipping away from his parents' home more and more. We see him less, and, and suddenly he's got ideas that they're not our ideas. They're coming from her, and I am so painfully aware that the beginning of this beautiful young love is coming at the cost of, of a relationship, of this parental mooring. And so... Even the first stages of the first loves start with endings to say nothing of our very grown up stages, right? And didn't I have to lose the last love to to have this new connection? And mm -hmm. Even the birth of your child, any child, right? Isn't that an ending? I mean, because it's the death of, especially your first, it's kind of the death of self. That's right. In a way. And so grief and joy for me are so intricately intertwined. And so when I went to write the introduction, the thing that had happened in my life last year was my father's passing. Mm -hmm. And as I sat down to write this book about love, it was so in the light of that huge ending and that huge outpouring of love. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like the fitting place to begin any kind of discussion because that grief and that joy are intimately entwined, mm -hmm. for me at least. Yeah, I feel like what I loved so much, Rainier, is it feels like somehow like a mature look at love, but that also feels like a sonnet to love. And I feel like you, there's a way that that's always your gift with writing. Like you speak to things that are like, the challenges and you talk about like embracing love despite its impermanence. And there's something so potent about the way, even just now you were talking about like the death of something, even when love is beginning, because I think there's like often a resistance to these truths that mm -hmm. there, there is an impermanent impermanence and that there is a death of something. I think for so many of us, there's a resistance to the death of the version of self that I am when I am only thinking about me and my priorities and what I want. And we resist that, but we also resist the impermanent nature of love in the form that it's in. And we cling and we control and we manipulate. And a lot of times I'm always so struck by how immature we are in our like way of holding what it is to love someone, you know? Yeah, you even call it like fantasy love. That's right. right. Well, and where do we get that fantasy love? I mean, when I reflect back on it, it's those moments and be they preciously little mm -hmm. in our potentially insufficient childhoods where we did have something that resembled unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Even if it was just for a moment, even if we had a neglected childhood or or a, a, a scarcity childhood, there were undoubtedly moments 
where our caregivers created some kind of perhaps unreciprocated, or at least the need was unreciprocal, hmm. connection. And it felt so good. And I think a lot of us have been seeking that unconditional, unreciprocal love, fantasy love, ever since, hoping that our primary caregiver would come along in the form of beautiful woman, beautiful man, and, and we would be happy again. Yep. Yes. And this is a fantasy, right? I, I learned it the hard way in my first marriage. I learned that you could not behave badly over and over and over and hope that someone would keep on showing up. They are not the deity, mm -hmm. right? And we have to learn that at some point in time. So I think for me, part of the awareness of this is that love's impermanence, love's conditionality um, is wrapped up in a mature and adult vision of it. Like I have to show up and recognize not all love lasts. Every lovership ends. Every lover leaves. Yeah. Everyone dies. None of us make it out alive. Yeah. I wrote a post a while ago about love being conditional. And I had so many responses to it that were trying to defend against this idea, right? Like, no, the concept of love is love is infinite. And I'm like, yes, I get that. But what I'm saying is love between two adults, like a chosen, whether it's a partner or a friend, that's conditional, right? Like, we do have to act. I mean, I can love you, but I, I'm going to maybe decide that I have to love you from afar, right? There is There are conditions to that kind of love. You can't, for example, continue to show up poorly and expect somebody to always be there to receive it, right? And I don't think a lot of people want to realize that because they want what you're saying, which is they want the parent. They want somebody who's going to come in and reparent them. Right. And wouldn't it be nice? I mean, Hemingway ends his first novel uh, with a exchange between the two main characters and the, the the female the heroine character says oh we could have been and she rattles off this laundry list of what could have happened between them and we could have done this and it's it's all very flowery it's very beautiful and Hemingway has his main character look at her and say what a pretty thought and I <laughs> love that like sometimes I look at a lot of these things and I go what a pretty thought mm -hmm. You know, hmm. it's like, and there's an expiration to those pretty thoughts and they haunt us. They hurt us when we buy into them. I think I would rather accept love's inevitable endings, love's conditionality. That is a much more beautiful form or vision of love to me. Once I can say this ends, God, then I treasure it. I have fallen in love hmm. with women at a coffee shop for 15 minutes of eye gazing. I mean, no joke. I was just looking over at them and I was so inspired and I would sit down in my journal and write some kind of beautiful sonnet and be so enamored with this stranger across a coffee shop who I will never see again. And that was a very weak and mm, single serving vision of love. And it ended. I didn't need it to continue. Mm. I could move on. Mm. God, that's so interesting. And it, like, as you say that, I'm thinking about this idea of they are not the deity, right? Yeah. That you just said. There's this story you tell early in the book where you're, I don't remember how old you were, but like a little boy in school and you were in love with this girl and you tell the most beautiful story of like figuring out how to get some money together to buy her a necklace. Um, and what I was so fascinated about as I was reading it, is this idea of how we sort of make this person the deity. Like yeah. you and your like childhood innocence, like you hadn't really talked to her about your love. The two of you didn't have like a shared understanding. And yet I was holding this vision of like what our experience and walking around the playground or whatever it was would be without sort of like, you know, what I'm I guess saying is like, it ends up being a projection that isn't really about that person so often, right? We meet someone and we start like going through like how this person is going to like solve all of these things, this unworthiness that I've felt for a lifetime. And a lot of times that has nothing to do with them, but we're like making them our higher power and imagining they're going to make us feel something that no human could possibly make another person feel, right? That, that story is so delightful to me. I have a handful of them and <laughs> uh, and all of which to say, it starts early. Yes. I mean, I was seven in that story. And uh, and to recap, and I hope that people get around to reading this in the book, but 
Oh my God. I adored her name was Jackie. <laughs> and I remember Jackie. She had big bangs, which was the style of the time. Like permed bangs yeah, specifically. Oh, yeah. And the child of the nineties all know those bangs. Right. And <laughs> <Very> long <laughs> brown hair. And I remember her giant smile. And I loved her. I mean, whatever vision of love a seven year old is capable of, it was full on. And I'm drawing her name with hearts around it in my trapper keeper and mechanical pencil. And she doesn't know my name. I mean, she she does not know who I am. And I got home one day and my older brother who's a decade older than me and was a bit of a shyster in my life. He um, he was selling necklaces. And I don't know if they actually were 14 karat gold necklaces. Picture a 17-year-old dude. Yeah, like opening his trench. We would have been saying some I. I love it. Great <laughs> racket. And, you know, I was like one of his first customers. And so he... <laughs> seven. But I don't have 30 bucks, you know. And he kind of leans in. I remember he says, well, you should get it. And so I, I don't know how I'm going to get it, but I remember that my parents have a vacation jar. And the vacation jar is where they put their change. And across a year, they, uh, they will, you know, get enough money to rack up a little special holiday for us all. Well, this is a great place to siphon off money if one needs an extra $30 for this girl to have a gold necklace. So I, I steal $30 in quarters from my parents, which will later be found out. But in that moment, it was a great idea. And I take it to my brother and he doesn't ask too many questions about where I got it from. And he hands me this necklace and I put it in one of my father's envelopes that he uses for his business. And I think it even had its like mailing address on it. And I take it and I give it to her. She runs away. She still probably doesn't know my name. The next day, she's giving it back to me. And it was so sweet. I, I, I actually remember it as she hands the envelope back. And I say, why are you giving it back? And she says, well, my parents told me to. Which, you know, makes sense. Maybe a seven-year-old shouldn't be getting a gold necklace and, and, uh, or whatever it was. And, uh, and she, and, and then I said, well, why would they make you give it back? Why? And she says, well, because I don't like you. And then she runs off. And I, I remember like a scene from a movie, the, the gold necklace just slipping from my hands. And, and I'm, I'm standing there with my heart, right? And this is one of those first rejections. A lot of times people ask like, what are you really talking about with this book? Like, what are you trying to say? And I think the thing I'm trying to say is wrapped up right there that a lot of love is wrapped up in fear. And we learned that fear early on, like a fear that we're going to be rejected, fear that they won't love us back, fear that if I tell them the truth, they, they, they won't want me anymore. Whether we're in a relationship or out of a relationship, and we learn that so fast. I think love is a tremendous risk, whether you're seven or 70. And it takes a lot of courage. Well, like even, God, there's so many thoughts as you're you're describing that story and I'm dropping in and just feeling so much for this little boy who so early had this conceptualization that we all have that like my love is something I have to... Like for yeah so like I need to I mean, do something yeah. to make you love me and it's like this like not enough as I am wound that like all of us mm -hmm. like where does it come from how do we like where do we learn that why Especially was like parents right I'm thinking geez I'm like where did he was sure seven like, who told him that? we need to barter right what a delightful thing too I mean I think like what a sweet and innocent thought that and there's a, another story, actually, which didn't make the book, but is equally painful in my early anxious attachment mm -hmm. style, where I had, I had marbles I had collected for quite some time, Steelies and Shinies and, you know, Aggies and, and the cat's eyes, you know, the kind that the late 90s or the late 80s was so abundant with. And I had collected them for a good while, and there was a girl, and again, I remember her name, this is second grade, named Lisa. It's a Lee, very 80s name. Lee, oh, and she had this beautiful, like, puffy <laughs> vest that she would wear and this bowl haircut that she sported. And and so, you know, again, a child of the 80s. And, <laughs> and every day she would reach into my bag of marbles and she would take one of them as a gift to her. And it was quite delightful. I mean, it was this wonderful exchange where I would get her presents in exchange for marble. 
And then I remember she reached in the bag and took the last marble. And it wasn't so much that I ran out of marbles. It was the thought that tomorrow she won't reach in the bag anymore. And she won't want to be with me. <laughs> and and I, mean, I, I literally remember this agony coming over me thinking, there's nothing she wants of me anymore. And this is the visual representation, though. I mean, this is exactly what Danae was saying. Like, where does this start? I mean, there's beauty in it now. I think to be able to reflect on it in the innocence of it and, you know, the lessons that were learned and and be able to almost feel into because everybody listening can relate in some way to that feeling of that young, you know, desire. But I don't know. It's the therapist in me where I'm like, oh, like that story, though, right? And how does that how does that continue on? And how does that kind of color, I suppose, the way you show up in love? I mean, you kind of jokingly said, like, oh, me and my anxious attachment, you know? Well, and here's something I'm kind of interested to hear your perspective on, Rainier, since we have you. Because I was watching something yesterday, and we were sort of sharing it back and forth, a group of um, our girlfriends that we have, like, you know, how you, like, send reels on, like, a chat through Instagram. And it was basically, they They were studying a group of men, asking them, like, would you be with a woman who's more successful than you, right? And all of these men were like, oh, absolutely. I'd love it. Like, that would be amazing if a woman made more money than me or, like, had a more successful career. And they put that same group of men in a room with women who made more money, had more successful careers. And all of a sudden, they all, like, were repelled, never more. That doesn't interest me. Weren't engaging with these women. And... I I find it so interesting because like the point of the person who was sharing the reel was that like there's something in like the pain point for the masculine collective that I am what I can provide. And if Mm. I can't provide, what is like, where is my worth? Right. And I think I felt a little of that is and I get it like it is so beautiful and pure and like a seven year old boy. But I think something about like that collective programming hurts my heart a little bit a bit for like my son and men like as they get older and think I am what I can provide to a a woman do you know what I mean well again starting very early as we're seeing and perhaps that programming was right there from the very beginning I think that one of the things that happens is we have that unconditional experience of a parental figure's love Mm. and I I don't think it has to last long I think it has to last for all of one hug And I think it's like the slot machines in Vegas or Reno. It's like you deposit one coin, you get a payoff. You get your $30 in nickels comes back to you. And then what do you do? You spend the rest of the day dropping nickels back in that machine until they're all gone. You spend all $30 when initially it was only one. So I think that actually what happens is we experience a a modicum of love and affection Mm. from the places and the ways that we do. And then we keep seeking it. Mm. But it doesn't come wrapped up in a perfect package. Our parents weren't pa- perfect and and largely insufficient. I mean, right. all of us had right. insufficient childhoods, really. And so that belief in unconditional love that we keep seeking our whole life comes wrapped up in a lot of tricky behaviors, mm. mm-hmm. right? And so for me, it might be a preoccupied father or a hyper available and yet slightly frightening mother. And, uh, and so all of that then becomes what I seek from then on, right? I begin to seek that unconditional love plus the preoccupation. So then, then when I walk into a bar and I sit next to someone who is very available, very kind, very loving, very doting, I'm like, ah, something's got wrong with her, don't you think? I don't know. <laughs> What's wrong with that person? I don't know why. I'm but just I show attracted. up to the bar and I see the person and she won't look at me. She won't talk to me. I'm like, my God. Ooh, that's, <laughs> that's the like, one I that's want. It's all of us. Right? And why? Why? Yeah. Because the tracks are laid. That's right. Right? Like the unconditional love got overlaid with the tracks of preoccupation. Yeah, that's interesting, this idea of preoccupation. I was just thinking like, okay, if I were to flip it and go more what my understanding for myself around being more of an avoidant is, is a little bit more what you were saying about the person at the bar, which is for me, I don't actually want the person to be preoccupied. I actually want them to love me in a way that feels like my sense of self won't be exterminated. Yeah. And so because my experience of love is that in order to be loved, I can have a sense of self. 
that's what I look for, right? Or really what it is, I actually just reenact that wounding, right? Um, and so it's funny because I'm thinking to myself, as like a kid, what would I do in that situation with the marbles? And I'm like, I'd be like, bitch, get your own marbles. <laughs> like, <laughs> if it was like a little boy, for example, right. I can imagine being like, get out of here with that shit and can't have my marbles. But isn't it funny how like that, even at that age, I can very clearly in my body be like, hell no, I would never let that person have my marbles. Um, it's so like the tracks so are so interesting. <laughs> Yeah, they're so entwined, aren't they? I and mean, I wouldn't want them to have it. I'd be like, no, get your own. These are mine. And it's not like a sharing mine. It's just like, it's like you're taking something from me. God, I should have learned from You should have been my friends and defended me in that moment. I, I had no one and nothing. Well, but the truth was, you know, again, if I could psychoanalyze myself all the way back then, we had been moving. My, my family was, we were moving relentlessly kind of almost every year, every three years. I wasn't collecting a lot of friends. Close friends, yeah. I, I didn't have many relationships. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden when someone showed interest, it was so uh, intoxicating, mm -hmm. right? I needed that. And of course I needed that. Sure, of course. Like that was actually my organism doing exactly what it should do yep. to retain the tribe that was necessary. And this is one of my thoughts. I think that we pathologize a lot. And by the way, I, I can pathologize this with the best of them. And I certainly have spent a lot of my life doing it. But I think that one of the things that is painfully true and increasingly so this last year is I think that it all works out. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I feel so woo-woo even saying this, but it does go back to the death of my father last year. Mm -hmm. And... Um, you know, my siblings and I had all these conspirators meetings about how we're going to care for him and all the really hard questions about what happens when the life support, you know, takes over and he can't do these things on his own and, and he's fading fast. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a week before he died, I had this very hard, difficult conversation with him where I pleaded with him to do what was necessary to stay alive for another decade. I mean, I was so optimistic, right? It didn't occur to me that even just a week later, he would be gone. So I spent an hour on the phone with him, pleading, cajoling, coercing, arguing, doing everything in my power to keep him around. And then, and then my siblings and I had all of these times where we're talking. And you know what I look back on? I think how unnecessary those conversations were how actually it was going to happen exactly as it was going to happen. If I have a regret, it's I just wish I would have talked to him for an hour. I just wish I would have listened to his stories. I wish I would have just sat at his bedside for that hour rather than arguing. And I, I think that life is going to take you where it needs to go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Maybe that is where so many of us get wrecked in love is that we think we need to coerce and control and resist life. And I think we get into a lot of trouble because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the point where you were talking about the end of your father's life and um, read because I like wrote it down because I through tears as I was reading it. But you said the little boy he had held so closely and also simultaneously the man who held him at a distance. And didn't we miss each other in these misaligned moments? And I thought how much that is true of love, that there are all of these moments where, God, especially, like, I feel like I haven't heard someone talk about the complexity of parental love in the way that you wrote about it here, um, that a little bit of what Vanessa is saying, like that struggle to be a self yeah. And that there's like so much of like our self that is wrapped up in like our parents' experience of us and um, some part of us still, as much as we can sort of intellectually understand things and create all of these like things that like distance us from our parents or like the ways that we pathologize them and their behavior and still that child in us that just wants those moments you describe where we feel held and safe in the comfort of their gaze and loved without condition like all of us i just believe still hunger for that to some level when well, you call level. it the paradox right i mean this is the paradox of love it's like what you say it's like real love true love requires the individual and it also requires surrendering to this greater whole and i don't think that's just in romantic love i think that's any love parental friend family you know otherwise 
child. I actually, this was really important to me when I set out to write a book on love. Um, because I think that, first of all, romantic love, when we say love, romantic love is king. Uh, in our culture, mm -hmm. I, I jokingly like to say, in the absence of God, yes. uh, we have made romance the make the our partner, the God, yes. Oh, that's right. And, of course, the new order of priests or therapists and coaches. And, <laughs> and sin is, you know, our attachment disorders. And, mm, yes. and you know, we need a savior to come in and help us. And it's usually our next partner. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that how I wanted to understand love was not just romantic, but was familial, mm -hmm. platonic, even vocational, that, that actually love is rightly understood a transformational event mm -hmm. in which I, I actively surrender my selfhood to your goodwill in a process by which I will both merge with you and then unmerge with you in a successive series of waves, like waves on the shore. And so I will lose myself. I mean, and I can feel that. I can feel anxiety in my body, literally hearing you say those words. And I've done a lot of work on myself. It's yes. Well, and actually, I, I mean, I want to speak to that in a, in a few moments because I think understanding attachment for me has become a, a bit of a nuanced thing. But, mm -hmm. but I think that, that that wave of self to other, self to other, is actually the developmental stages of a relationship, any relationship. Mm -hmm. So I, I have a friend who's wrapped up in new love and as his close friend, oh my God, I'm so concerned. He's losing himself. And I just rescued him from the last day of relationship. <laughs> we and, just got through And this. we just had our intervention and now here we are. And, and you know, I, I kind of have to chuckle because I go, and of course he's gonna lose himself. Mm. And then I know what happens because I've watched love happen a few times. He will find himself again. He will remember who he is. And then we will say, but remember, there's something great about her. Remember the first days when you fell, right? And so it's so funny how we go, the pendulum swings, waves upon a shore. I think that is the inevitability of love. We find ourselves, we lose ourselves, we find ourselves again. Over and over. Oof. Well, see, even like, and this is like always my premise. And I think I worked in addiction recovery before I became a therapist. And there's something about the way we talk about the intervention and we lose ourselves in the like dopamine hits and the. And to me, a lot of times it ends up being that obsession with the object and not about that person. Yes. Which also, in what you're saying, I don't know that I think it has to be that. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts because I agree with the like, I lose myself in the this love in service to like, I believe love in its, I don't always say purest form, but is like, you make me want to be better. Yeah. You make me want to rise to like who I have the potential to be because I love you. Yeah. But the rising is the love, not the like, I am diminished. And I think so often it is like the diminishment of self. Do you know what I mean? Well, I do. And so actually, you know, I think that love runs through a certain sequence of developmental stages. Hmm. And I simply don't think that you can skip the human condition. I don't think any of us arrived here fully formed. <laughs> Neither do I think that love can simply develop into mature love. Mm -hmm. Even if you're a great communicator, even if you're like, I'm showing all of my red flags at once so you can know me. <laughs> and I, I think it does simply take its course. Mm -hmm. And so that first stage, I, I, I fundamentally believe union is the first stage. My job, my organism is doing its work to get up off of the couch and blend my life with another. That is my evolutionary impulse. Mm. Otherwise, I will remain in my comfortable isolation. <laughs> and so you are- That was aggressive. You saw that, right? But the funny thing is, is as I turned, you turned away because you knew the term was coming. <laughs> oh, man. For those not, not watching but listening, I just aggressively- looked Carry on, me. please, Rainier. Oh, oh man. I feel like I walked into something. <laughs> but I think that that first stage- of, of union is so necessary. Now, the discomfort that the two of you or one of you just showed. Um, I think <laughs> She's it's got her own version of it. Don't let I her. think it's important. And so here's a, here I want to talk about attachment and potentially attachment disordering. I think at its core, ambiguity and our ability to sit with ambiguity is wrapped up in almost 
every one of the attachment insecurities we talk about. For instance, someone may feel real insecure at that first stage of love. Oh, it might produce all kinds of insecurity, the ambiguity of, do they like me? Do, do, do they really care? Do they want to have union with me? So we might call that stage anxious. And, and, and why, why are they so anxious? Because the beginning stages of love feel too uncertain. So my anxious attachment is not so much an anxious attachment as much as it is the insecurity around the first stage of love, the ambiguity of the first stage. Someone later down the road, say in the second or third stage of love, which might be a little more even murdering, and they're like, oh my God, I have to, I'm going to blend myself with this person. The uncertainty that that would create in me, well, we might call that person a little more avoidant in nature, right? But we each have uncertainty at different stages in this, right? And so that inability to sit with ambiguity and uncertainty is at its core our attachment disordering. Right. And so if I look at those stages, you know, the first stage is union. The second stage, which lasts, I think, forever for a lot of couples is collusion. Mm -hmm. It's like I met your mask. Your mask was wonderful. Your mask was all the best. Mm -hmm. And I really fell in love with that mask, who you were saying you were and who you always are. And and now that we're together, I need you to always be the person you said you were. You can't change. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be the same and I have to be the same. And we collude with each other to keep the illusion alive. The third stage of love would be disillusion. And that can happen in the first week or that can take a 10 year toll, you know, all of a sudden the masks come off. Mm -hmm. I, I've shared with you guys before on, and Christy, my partner was on the podcast. We shared a powerful disillusion moment mm -hmm. where I confess infidelity to her. And didn't the masks fall off in that moment? Didn't there arrive an opportunity to see one another as we were? So many couples have this. It could be over the dishes. Oh my God, he's an asshole who doesn't like to do the dishes. Or it could be something like infidelity or integrity or big things, small things. The masks come off. The fourth stage of love is possible only after disillusionment. And that is communion which is not just union, it's union after the masks have fallen off. And so I think that what you're talking about, Danae, earlier, this, this idea of, do we have to like lose ourself? Um, in the end, no. In the end, I believe a mature love, the definition of a mature love is, is a love that makes you more of a self, not less. But I think that happens in the span of a timeline, be it in a moment, a week, or 50 years, I think it's progressive in nature. And what I think is so interesting about this, again, curious to hear your thoughts, because I think when I work with couples who are like on their second and third marriage or a little bit older, I think some of that, and this is why I think it's so fascinating that you writing about love in the context of death, I think some of that ambiguity gets a little bit knocked out of us, like our like inability to sit in it once we've sat through some of the like, I'm going to die because a lot of times yeah, yeah. the like thing that we're looking for in that other person is that higher power is that like relief from the existential angst. And it's like, once we sort of say like, they're going to be human because yeah. humans going to human. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sort of signing up for this deal with another human, but it feels like some of that feels easier. And of course, like it's real easy from my couch. And I get that Vanessa before you start to say it, but <laughs> I'm joking, but some of that I do feel like the expectations I have as a woman in my 40s are so much lower than they were in my earlier years of attempting to love someone. And I don't know, in some ways that feels like the gift of a little bit of um, loss, you know? I think that once you realize the end is coming mm. ooh, ooh. And, and that you're going to lose them and there's no perfect relationships because there are no perfect people and there are no perfect situations and everything, even the best of connections involve pain. Mm. Um, once you accept that, I think that you really can get on with the business of loving someone. Mm. So I do agree. I think that, that there is a certain degree of maturity that may come with age. Mm. You know, I remember driving with my dad, one of my favorite stories 
of him, and this has no relevance on what we're talking about, but maybe it has all the relevance. You know, my dad and I had such a complicated relationship. Most children I know have complicated relationships with their parents, but, mm. but you know, I was in my mid thirties and I decided I would take a road trip to a business conference in Las Vegas. And I forgot that it was February and that there are mountain passes between Oregon and um, Nevada. And it just didn't occur to me that my little Honda or my Toyota Prius might not be equipped to go through those mountain passes. <laughs> And I had not been on a significant road trip in many years, which is why I thought it would be a great idea. And so I take off my Prius and, and then I forget to actually have a map outside of my iPhone. It doesn't occur to me to have. So I was greatly unprepared, except I did have a lot of snacks in the car. That was the only thing I was That's prepared on. That's the tourist on. in you, by the way. <laughs> totally. It takes one to know on my phone. Oh my God. All the snacks. I also had a playlist. We'll figure it out as we go. Literally we thinking snacks. you would have snacks. <laughs> and my music was great. Yep, my set it. lists were that's amazing. It. Music in the stats. <laughs> and so, so here I am. And then the, um, the signal goes out. Yep. And so... So I, I actually don't know where I am on the map. I haven't seen a car in two hours. I'm now headed into a blizzard and I'm terrified. And I get about one bar on my phone and my dad had spent the his lifetime as a, as a minister traveling from camp meetings and revivals to churches. He's what I like to call a driver. And as a driver, he stayed calm and I knew who to call as a man in my mid thirties. I'm going to call my dad, who my relationship isn't all that great with. But I say, Dad, I'm I'm in the middle of a, a, a blizzard. Would you think about um, just talking me through it? You know, he stayed on that line for six hours. Mm -hmm. uh, it was incredibly sweet. He just talked me through that whole thing. And then as I got closer to Vegas, he, uh, he said, hey, kiddo, um, I don't have plans this weekend. Can I just fly down to you and drive you back? You know, there's not too many moments when a, when your elderly father can rescue your grown ass adult self. And so we spent the next three days driving back and talking about all of these things. And I just got three beautiful days where I could just ask my dad just about everything about his life. And I decided I'm just going to use these three days and make him uncomfortable. <laughs> it was the greatest gift. Um, and I really don't know why I'm telling you that story, except to just say, I think that uh, there was this moment when I said, dad, you know, you're not the dad I remember. Like, I kind of remember you as an angry father and you're not. And he said, oh, I'd like to say I did a lot of work and. I'd like to say I went to a lot of therapy and I read a lot of good books, but the truth is that I think this might be the sanctification of aging. Mm -hmm. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I just think I just paid attention to life across the years and I let it just age me a little and temper me a little. Boy, I have a lot of hope in that. Like if we just hang on long enough, and pay attention to life long enough and listen to it long enough that it might temper us. We get so wrapped up in needing to make all the changes and all the moments, but. I'm like, yeah. God, there, it's a little bit, you know, we keep talking about it's not just romantic love, right? Like these stages of love are in any love, right? I'm thinking about how the last few times there's been something that's gone on, complicated relationship with my mother. And John has been the one from the outside to say, I don't think your mom is who you remember her to be. Mm. I think you're seeing your mom through the lens of how you used to see your mom, like who she used to be. And I get it, right? But I think you need to let go of that because I think you're missing who she is. I think you're missing who's in front of you. And it's just like, as you say that, she, there has been, there have, I mean, she's still who she is at her core. It will, it'll pop up every now and then. But she has even said to me, like, I'm just too old to care that much anymore. Like, too old to be that angry. I'm too old. And when you were saying the anger thing, I was like, God, that's it. It was like the remembrance that I had of her was the anger. And I think so much of that is what caused this, this complicated relationship. And I am still in relationship with that version of her. I left at 18. I never went back. And it takes somebody, like, outside, I think, sometimes also, or an experience like you had. And my mom and I just went to Paris last year for her birthday. I took her for her 60th and I had such an amazing time. 
And I was so like weary of it the whole time. Mm. And I'm going to cry saying this. I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop. And what you're saying is so powerful because it's like, I'm missing, you're missing it. <laughs> Mm. You know? Yeah, when you're at the end of time, you're like, oh, that I know just cry. Rainier, like, just know we're going to cry when Rainier comes on the podcast. It's just a given. It's, that's what's going to happen. Well, it is that line that you read, uh, Danae, and if you have it pulled up, if you might read it again, my my half, read that line, you know, the one, you, yeah. Um, and didn't we miss each other, misaligned moments? Is that, Yeah. God, and that's so all of our loves, all of our relationships. Like I'm so struck often when I'm sitting with couples, how they're just like missing each other Mm -hmm. because there's a story that is about someone other than the person sitting in front of them Mm -hmm. that they're telling, that they're defending against. And it's like, you're not actually like with each other in this moment. You're just missing each other. But And so I think actually this is such a, a, a beautiful gift that you're giving by sharing your experience because crash all of those things into my father's deathbed and here I am now knowing that I have moments with him left and uh, the the beauty of the sorrow of that is just so wrapped up and um, my father was just this tremendous order but at the very end he couldn't speak anymore and it took a while to realize that he was tapping his fingers to try and tell us things um, because he couldn't say it otherwise. And boy, you start to think, what would you do if it was your last smile? If you knew that you were so weak that you actually had to squeak out this next word and you may not get another one, who do you give this last handhold to? How, how do you parse out those moments? And I tell you, uh, the last couple of years of my father's life, I had had to draw some boundaries and uh, I did some things I thought were pretty damned important, you know, to preserve my selfhood, to, again, kind of move into that autonomy, that autonomous space where I am my own man, damn it. Can't you see who I am? All of those necessary distinctions faded in that moment. They just evaporated. It did not matter what what diagnosis I had given him. It did not matter the boundary of self I thought I needed to have. Those things evaporated. There was only withness. I think the stories that we hold, that you talk to, that hold us, you know, we think we have ideas, ideas have us. And I think that in that moment, it was so dissolving where you simply see naked truth, naked reality. So when I went to write this book, part of what I wanted to do was smash our faces up into these scenarios of, well, fathers and sons, uh, uh, relationships. Uh, one of the stories is a, is a couple, and um, and she's on her deathbed, and he is kind of taking care of her, and there's implications that he's making amends for things that he might have done in the past, and then, you know, it's like, well, what happens when our faces get smashed up against the micro moments of life? I think that what happens is we lose our clear-cut definitions of right and wrong and what should be and what shouldn't be. And we're left with simply standing there in that living room or that bedroom or in Paris. And we're going like, oh my God, who, who is this person? Can I just experience them in this moment? That's what I wanted to communicate in all of this. Not a lot of pretty thoughts or good ideas. Just the experience of being in love, whether it's with a father or a mother or a child or your lover. I don't even know your dad, but the way that you talk about him and the way that the ideas come through you as if you're channeling, I imagine that you are much like him. Mm, Thank you. That was an oddity, actually. I uh, I ended up reading a eulogy at one of his two funerals, and uh, it was so funny. It was just how many people who had known him and 
uh, he had been a, a significant person in his world oratorically and people came up and like, oh my God, you are so much like your father. And it was actually such a beautiful gift to receive that people don't die. They live on through us. Relationships that we lose, they don't really go away. They they teach us. Even bad relationships. I, I, I'm so struck. People are like, oh my God, that toxic relationship, that horrible relationship, it ruined everything, I think. But didn't you learn? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that your teacher? Um, I just take an agnostic view to the ideas of good and bad and that actually everything can become our teacher if we let it, including the most excruciating things. I have more love or more, I shouldn't say more love. I have more capacity to tap into the love that I actually felt even in the moment for my ex mm. fiance than I was ever capable of at the time. But it's, it is, I mean, yes, it could be, someone could say it's hindsight, but I, I have such like a, a reverence for who that relationship made me Down. become or, or helped me become or the lessons that I learned that my love for that man runs so deep. And I, I swear it's deeper now than I was even when I was with him. Whew. That is, and a, it was a, a quote curve. unquote toxic relationship, right? Um, but God, I mean, the love is so deep. I would love if my exes said that about me. I don't think they're going to. But... I, mean, I don't think he feels the same way. <laughs> but it, that's the other thing. I don't need him to. Yeah, that's right. Of course, right. I would love him to, right? But I don't need him to. I'm able to kind of like extend that energetically without an expectation, I suppose, of return. And what a grace. What a grace to ourselves, to someone else that you can look back and you can say, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, I'm so struck. You know, there's another moment in that same thing I was reading about those final moments with your father where I was thinking about, like, what changes as we become a parent in terms of our relationship to our parents. And mm -hmm. I think there's just, you know, my little boy is six and there are all of these ways that I start to see him really like becoming a little bit more differentiated and a little bit more of a self. And like, he'll say something to like remind me of that. And I'll be like, oh, right. You're your own per little person, right? Um, and like your father in those final moments, like you describing him seeing this little boy, I think there's just such a... You know, my little boy will do this thing sometimes where he'll just be like, mommy, come be with me, you know, just like be with me. Mm -hmm. And there's something about like how we have this inability to just be with each other mm -hmm. without an agenda and a narrative. Mm -hmm. And that is like what I think a little bit of distance gives us sometimes mm -hmm. is just to like be with who that person was, but it can be hard up close. It is so difficult. And, and, you know, I love, and I'm sitting here with other parents and I, I think that there is something so beautiful when you become a parent. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know if you have to become a parent of a, of a child. I think, I think you can become a parent of a piece of art, a parent of an organization or a project. But, but when, when you pour your heart and soul into something and you actually do have those moments where you realize, oh my God, um, I can be with this thing. Mm -hmm. It's not about getting it right. It's not about demanding some kind of rigid perfectionism. And and it, it takes a long time. And God, I, I know that you don't always even get there, but we have those glimmers. And so then if I can borrow against that truth that I think uh, at least all of us sitting in this room have had maybe towards our own children in moments, you know, if I can borrow against that moment and bring that into, say, romantic love and go, do I have to have this rigid expectation of this person? Do I have to expect that they will agree with me all the time? And I think one of the things that I, I, I'm most amused by these days is this idea of compatibility. <laughs> um, and recently I actually posted something about compatibility where I, I said, like, actually, we negotiate for compatibility. Mm -hmm. Compatibility is created. Uh, today, these days, it gets talked about like it's a fortune telling session. And it's like, you're either compatible or you're not. And I can, you know, predict reasonably that we are not forever. It's like, well, actually, I think we create compatibility. Mm. I think that we sit with someone and we negotiate those spaces and we say, what can I live with? What can I, uh, what can't I live with? What, what about you and what about me merge into something new? And I mean, I think chemistry happens all at once, but I think, I think that compatibility emerges over time and we go, oh, this was worth it to me. 
I love this idea of negotiation versus compromise. Because I, and I know that Danae feels some, like I've, 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 I struggle with the word compromise, yeah. right, um, in relationships. Because to me, it feels like if I have to compromise, I have to give something of myself up. Right? Yes. And again, avoid in here. Yeah. That's hard for me. I'm very clear. Um, but this idea, the idea of negotiation, that actually feels so powerful to me. Because yes, like being in any relationship, true, intimate, vulnerable relationship, I don't care what kind of relationship that is is going to require negotiation. It is. And I think that we're kidding ourselves if we actually don't think that that's part of it, right? Yeah. Um, but I I'm gonna start using that because that feels so resonant in my body, whereas I feel like the term compromise makes me kind of shut, kind of shut up, shut down a yeah. little bit. Um, um, I have to toy with that a little bit. I would argue a lot of times the negotiation is with myself and the story yeah, I'm sure. telling myself about who this person needs to be. Yeah, amen. Like I think so much of what has been so like an education for me in loving is actually my relationship with Vanessa mm -hmm. because on like paper, we might not be compatible. We are so different in our experience of the world. But what she has taught me is what it is to like that two people can hold with such reverence, mm -hmm. how you experience the world and what that brings into my life mm -hmm. that I might not always have as my first response. And I think so often, like that's what we're attracted to in someone is that you experience the world differently than me, but I need you to be different so that I can believe that we're compatible. And it's like, but is that true? Like, why, why is it true? Can I be in the negotiation around the story I'm telling myself around this person needs to be a certain way for me to exhale? That's you know? powerful, right? Because basically what you're saying is like, is if chemistry is something that kind of happens, yeah. right? It's unspoken, it's energetic, it's other lifetimes, right? There's things that we just will never be able to articulate or understand right. about why and what chemistry is, right? Like you and I had immediate chemistry. There was a knowing, like we've done this before, yep. no question, right? But if we, it's like chemistry and compatibility, how do I articulate the, it's like, I look at somebody and I say, oh my God, we have so much chemistry, but we're not compatible. And so I might walk away, right? But but the compatibility, what we're all saying right now, is actually a negotiation sometimes, whether that's with self, whether that's with the other person, whether that's with the dynamic, whatever. And if we if we don't, I suppose, take the risk on or do the work of the negotiation, we're actually letting slip something that is potentially larger than us, right? Mm. Which is that like spark of you were drawn into my life for a reason. I was drawn to you for a reason. That in and of itself is chemistry. Mm -hmm. And if I get so caught up in the, but we're different, we're not compatible. Because to your point, on paper, one would say that we're not. Yeah. Then I'm missing the opportunity to be in union with somebody who actually I truly am compatible with. <laughs> it just doesn't look like it on paper. Yeah. Right? And actually, what's so beautiful, even if we use this example, is that something completely new yes. came out of these two, let's just call it potentially incompatible people, but a third and new and previously unknown thing now was born. And I think that's the truly exciting part. You talk about losing self in the other. Well, part of what actually happens is we both dissolve ourselves mm. into a greater identity yep. or organismic reality, which is the relationship itself. Yes. Right. And so I, I think that's a really beautiful truth. I, you said something earlier that makes me think of a lot of people lose the plot line, though, early on. Mm -hmm. So for me, I know when I've lost the plot line. I have, I have boiled it down. I have distilled it down to a couple of key statements. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to happen anytime I have gotten into love with, quote, the wrong person. Mm -hmm. and, and I'll tell you what it is. Um, it's going really good. Maybe we met at that bar. Uh, or it's a text and it's just, oh, it's feeling so great. And then there's this line from one or the other. Who are you? I mean, really? Who are you? And what are we? Now, this could happen in the, like, the first hour or the first week, but it usually happens suddenly and up front. And it's that question of what is this? And so what I actually think can happen very early on is I stop looking at you, you stop looking at me, and now we're engaged with the possibility of the connection. And we cease to actually see the person in front of us and we be begin to borrow against a potential future. You know, don't date on potential. This is that moment. But it's not the potential of you. It's the potential of us. 
And that initiates an immense amount of dopamine. My dopamine goes off the charts when I imagine that we could be the most amazing thing ever, the best business partners, the greatest family members, the, the best lovers, and all of a sudden now I have this expansive emotional experience. And that's where the addiction starts. Oof. My emotional intensity now ratchets up, but it's not really about you. Mm -hmm. It's about this possible connection. I think that is a very cheap addiction that happens early on, and we do not get addicted to that person. We get addicted to the emotional intensity itself. Mm -hmm. That fuel runs out pretty quick. Mm -hmm. For one thing, because actually positivity, positive things actually deplete fairly fast. Mm -hmm. So then you have to start looking for other fuel sources besides positive potential. Th then you start to look for um, problems to solve. So I feel like the second phase of like the emotional intensity cycle is like, I'm looking for problems to solve because problem solving makes us feel really good as a species. Mm -hmm. So I can maintain my emotional intensity, which is what my real addiction is too. Mm -hmm. I can maintain it by solving problems endlessly. So then you hear like, well, God, if our parents just understood us, or if, you, if we could just live closer together, how can we problems? Mm -hmm. Couples can live in the problem solving addiction part of that cycle for a long time and that fuels their relationship still not based around you and me based around the us we're problem solving our connection third stage because that fuel source runs out pathologizing stage the problems run out and you become the problem or i become the problem now that fuel source is abundant because like it's easy to think negatively of someone actually who you're smelling their dirty laundry a lot and it's also a very dirty fuel source. It becomes corrosive. And at the end of a lot of relationships, what I observe happening is people who were addicted to the emotional intensity up front, still addicted to the emotional intensity at the end, but it no longer feels very good. It's like you just did a lot of crystal math and it's like it's keeping you up at night, which you enjoy, but it feels like hell to your body system. God. It's so fascinating. So I read something in A Course in Miracles once, and I'm going to butcher exactly how they say it, but basically what they were saying that feels really in aligned with what, alignment with what you just described was people talk about like when you fall in love with someone, you're falling in love with like their representative or not their true self. But basically what they were saying, that's not true. When you first meet someone and you're in that space of discovery, that is them. That is like the self. And then all of this that you're describing gets in there. And then I leave them. I leave us. I am in the story that is in the future that, you know, the worthiness, the dopamine surge of what this could be. But initially, it's just two people discovering each other. And that is actually the truest version of self, right? That's it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, there's a way that you talk about it in terms of like you, how did you say it? When I was young, I said that love felt like fear, right? And I think that's like, to me, that's what you're describing a little bit and what you just said, right? Like, I, like I'm like i trying to like do something to contain the fear or be in negotiation around the fear. I you love know? that you just said fear. And I, I, I kind of smirked when earlier when you were telling the story and then you said, and that produces a lot of, and you paused and my mind went anxiety. And you went, <laughs> uh -huh. you went dopamine. <laughs> uh and I smiled because I was like, oh, wow, I took that in oh, a different direction. Which if you look at what's firing in the brain, it's yeah. probably not that yeah. dissimilar. And right? not to like, again, right. not to pathologize that, but what you've got a little bit more of the anxious kind of vibe versus a little bit more of the avoidant vibe. I think they're both producing dopamine, but I think for me, right. by story, yeah. it's the anxiety of like, oh, no, that actually produces it. Whereas somebody who might be more of a like, little anxious lean in, right. it's the other version of that that produces the dopamine. But I had to smile because I was like, oh, that's not where he went with <laughs> that. I well, it's that. all fear. But when you said Either fear, way. I was like, oh, that's yeah. what that is for me. But that's also what that is for you. And then that's why I really actually believe whichever side of the coin you fall on, one of the most underrated skills in relationship is just your ability to tolerate distress. Totally. Like your ability to simply sit with uncertainty, your ability to sit with ambiguity, your ability to have courage in the face of fear, right? And I, I really think that societally we could just pause there and talk about that 
as its own thing. But I think a lot of people come and they're like, how do I not be afraid? Recently, someone just said that, like, do you ever even experience fear anymore, Rainier? And I'm like, <laughs> all the time. Like, Still human. Like, what are you talking about? Like, I haven't ascended yet. But like, you know, I mean, like, but the reality for me is I don't think a lot of life is going to be without fear. Mm -hmm. I think it will be with fear. That's courage. My God. And, mm -hmm. and I think... I think that love feels like fear to a lot of us, yes. whether at the beginning stage or at the merging stage or like fear comes in. Yeah. How will I sit with it? How will I engage with it? And, and, and then if I allow it to inform me because I've done my work, because I've actually learned how to regulate myself within mm -hmm. that and to pause and make a wise minded decision, then I suddenly have options and mm -hmm. I can make something it's effective to my long-term goals. Mm -hmm. Oof, you're so wise right here. If only it translated into some areas in life, but. <laughs> <laughs> Self-deprecation. Everybody needs to read this damn book is what they need to do. Yeah, I mean, that you talk about, you know, like the editors that were reading the book and just a lot of people feeling like you were killing their ideas of love and that, um, that it's just like they, they found your book sad and I really experienced what you wrote differently. And you said, like, there's an order to this. Um, love is made of the debris of other loves. And I just, I love the idea of like, no, this is just like us having an adult conversation about what this is versus allowing all of these, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I was thinking like a, a depth word to... But like all of these other fears to take over and not like really be grounded. And yes, we're going to be, well, maybe um, we're going to be afraid. That's that's the price of entry into this beautiful thing called being alive and experiencing it through the other. And um, yeah, we're, we're going to be afraid. I mean, I think this book is a profoundly existential vision of life and love. It begins with the understanding that we lose everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, Jean-Paul Sartre was asked in an interview, uh, the father of French existentialism was asked if he suffered from despair. And I think he truthfully answered, I have never, uh, a day in my life, suffered from despair. And if you look at at least the French existentialists, separate from the American existentialists, the, the French existentialists seem to have this vibrancy about them. They're living these incredibly delighted champagne filled lives. Well, why? Like they have such a nihilist vision of the world. Well, it's wrapped up in this front, this sentence that Heidegger is actually attributed to where it's like life is meaningless and empty and it is empty and meaningless that it is empty and meaningless. So someone may say, Oh my God, it's so hopeless that you would say that life has no meaning. He said, well, stop making meaning out of it, yeah. actually. <laughs> You're making meaning out of meaninglessness. What rightly understood, it is a blank canvas. Yeah, it gets exciting. Oh, my God, that's when it's, it's delightful. It's liberating, right? Exactly. And so if I understand that there's an end, mm -hmm. if I start there to life, to love, mm -hmm. to lovership, then I can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. You know, the gods are jealous of humans mm -hmm. because humans live so short, mm. right? That means we have to cram it all in. You know, um, my youngest son, Mercer, is something of a soccer player. And I, I, I love watching him play soccer. And one of the reasons why I love watching him play soccer is because he plays all out. And this one particular soccer game was a good moment for both of us. And he scored four goals straight out of the gate. I mean, just went in, zing, zang. And the coach, being a kind-hearted coach, pulled my son to give equal playing time to the other players well the other team caught up and then scored two extra so now it's six to four last two minutes of the game mercer is just chomping at the bit he's just like <laughs> put me in coach put me in and it's raining and the field is muddy and the coach looks at him and says get in there kid and i'm like yes and my son gets the ball on the pitch and is running down the field score now it's five to six he actually then gets the ball again in a miraculous moment to tie it up when the other kid trips him. I mean, it was a clear trip. It was a violation if I've ever seen it. My son tumbles into the mud. The ball goes past him. The other team grabs the ball, runs it down, scores their next goal. They win. They win. 
My son gets up, tears are streaming down his muddy little face and comes over and I get to hug him. I say, but you played your heart out. Yeah, you did. Now, what I love about that moment is that is life. Mm -hmm. We don't win this game. We don't win the game. But you will be judged according to how you played. Did you play your heart out? Did you give your everything? Even when you fell in the mud, did you get back up? You may not have been carried out in the arms of cheerleaders, but but you you can walk away with your shoulders held back, your head held high. I think that is life, but that is also love. Did I love all out? Did I show up knowing I might not have gotten a great return on that? Love is a bad investment. I mean, if you just look at it from a <laughs> dollars and cents <laughs> sign. I mean, a lot of us, like, we took out to dinner and spent $200 on someone we might never see again. <laughs> Did you have a good dinner at least? I mean, can it be okay? So I think, like, that's the first part of this book. The, the, the second part of this book is courage over fear. Like, it takes courage to get up in the mornings. A courageous approach to life in the face of fear. I think the last part of this book that I think is profoundly existentialist for me is time. The degree to which we experience the subjective reality of time is the degree to which we allow ourselves to love. <sighs> Whether it's a moment, and I allow myself this 30 second in loveness with this person across the room that I will never see again, or it's 55 years, Time is so subjective, and the degree to which I realize my place as a being in time is the degree to which I allow myself to love. So the, I hope that people experience this as somewhat liberating to go, I want to play all out. Yes, yes. Yes. And it certainly is for me, and I'm so grateful for you, my friend. That I just think getting to know you in this lifetime is such a sacred gift, truly. I've been so impacted by so many things that you've said and written. Um, you are like, I'm going to cut one of those wise sage teachers mm -hmm. to me. And um, thank you for just like the way you show up and leave it all on a dance floor. You are more than welcome. And I, yeah. You know, even when I hear that, Danae, like coming from you and you, Vanessa, and just sitting here and I, I sit here and I sometimes think like, how the hell am I here? Like, how is this my life? <laughs> like, uh, uh, Blake said, the, the road of excess led to the palaces of wisdom. And so like, what is wisdom? Yeah. Like, I think wisdom is just you paid attention to life. Mm -hmm. I think that's, uh, you got that skill though, I think, and you're teaching people to do the same, you know? I think there's something connecting the three of us in this room that I would even probably say John, who's not in the room, which is I think that all of us strive to show up as somebody who's not preaching at you, but is saying, I'm here doing this too. Look, I just fell in the mud. Let me talk about it. Let me show you the mud. Let me show you the scars, right? I'm not afraid of it. I'm not ashamed of it. I, I hold it close as part of the experience and it's important to do so. And there is a little bit of me that wonders if that is some of that energetic connection is that I think that even maybe in an unspoken way or now, now a spoken way, I think all of us have a reverence for that and, and try our best to, to emulate that or to show up in that way. And I think to Danae's point, it's like learning so much from you, but I think there's a part of you. It's not just the words. It's the way you're like, no, this is me. This I'm doing this thing. That is how I learn. Right. It's the beautiful words, but it's also in going, yeah, but I saw in those words, I see that you just did that thing and you're muddy right now. Uh huh. You know, the, the, the thing that this week has been so beautiful for me is getting to connect to you guys. And there's a few other friends here in LA. And I, I wrote back to my wife, Christy, who couldn't join me this trip, even though I really wanted her to, but, but, um, we, we were texting back and forth and I said, it's so interesting because I feel so, and I used an interesting word, I feel so beloved. I mm -hmm. feel like I'm getting loved on a little by these people I'm connecting to. And I said, and I recognize the path here. And she said, well, what, what do you mean? And I said, well, I know how I got here. And she said, what do you mean? I said, it was just the day I decided to be a self in this world, mm -hmm. to just show up as myself. Mm -hmm. I had been doing so many things to avoid being a self in this world, masks and 
and all these different kinds of things. But the minute I showed up and said, no, no, this is me, all the faults, the failures, the foibles, the insecurities, it's all me. Mm -hmm. I think you can finally be loved when you show yourself. Mm -hmm. And until then, I think you can have a rough go of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -oh. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. We're so oh, grateful man. to get you in the flesh. Thank you. Why to not miss your flight? Thank you. Yes, it's probably also <laughs> good. You, you, you know LA better than I do. So. The mama in me is like looking at my clock going, you yeah. get to the airport, my friend. That's <laughs> great. Okay. Ew. Thank you for letting me hang out here. When does the book actually come out? Uh, I The date is mid-April. Pre-orders February 10. Okay, y'all. So, it's happening. So this is soon. Okay. Pre-orders, yeah. Let's get you. So it will it will happen, uh, and uh, it's so exciting. Yeah, I, I just I can't wait. Honestly, I'm so nervous about this. I, I've been so nervous, and even like hearing you guys say that you're, you're enjoying it, mm -hmm. I, I just honestly, there's so much of me in this book. Like yeah. it's not teaching. It's like it isn't separate from myself. Vulnerable. Oh, my gosh. And so. Ooh, love against time, everybody.